So you've got the first post-Torah book of the Bible for me? Yes, sir, I do. And can I just share with you how excited I am about it? Absolutely. What's got you so animated? This book actually has a plot, sort of. Oh, it does? After the murky, muddled, disorganized slop of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it is quite the breath of fresh air. Well, great. Lay some of that gripping plot on me, my man. I didn't say it was gripping. Oh, but beggars can't be choosers, so... It is what it is. Well, okay then. So, as you recall, God killed Moses at the end of the Torah. I do recall, but remember, we were going to try to stay away from words like kill when God murders people. I thought we agreed to stay away from words like murder when God kills people. Oh, well, now I'm confused. Yeah, me too. Let's avoid both words and phrase it like this. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. Maybe Moses was just at the end of his days and died of natural causes. Oh no, God picked the time and place and made sure to note, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Oh, sounds like Moses had a lot of mileage left. Clearly. How was it phrased when God killed Aaron? We use the word gather, as in he was gathered to his people. Wow, that sounds so much nicer than he was murdered. I know, right? Speaking of, if my neighbor lets his dog poop in my yard one more time, I'm going to gather him to his people with my bare hands. I'll forget you said that at your trial. <sighs> so... Who's next on the chopping block to lead God's chosen income poops? Joshua. You remember him, right? Oh, I certainly do. He and Caleb were the only studs jonesing for war when the Israelites first approached the Promised Land. That's the guy. This book is named after him. The book of Joshua, huh? I like it. A brand new chapter for the Israelites. So is God going to try anything different with his new go-getting vigorous leader? Nope, not really. It's just going to be more of the same. War and genocide. Oh. Okay, so what's the overall plan now? I told you, wars and genocides. A lot, a lot, a lot of wars and genocides. Yeah, I heard that part. What about the big picture? How do you mean? Well, Moses' whole thing was getting the Israelites out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Yeah, so is God, maker of the entire universe and of planet Earth, who has finally gotten his chosen people to their destination and installed a new leader going to have them take over the entire world? No. The whole Arabian Peninsula then? No. Then what? Just this tiny crap hole wedged in between a few geographical features. This is a very parochial god indeed. I thought the eastern boundary was the Euphrates, though. Yeah, that's what it says, but for all practical purposes, the Jordan is the actual demarcation line. Really? There is so much land between the Jordan and the Euphrates. Yeah, but have you seen it? It's utter desolate waste. Why would God draw boundaries that include a bunch of crap? Dude, I don't even know. Well, okay then. So does Joshua, being the new guy, face any of the same challenges to his leadership that Moses did? Oh, hell no. Any pretense that Joshua's decisions might be up for debate is totally dropped with this line. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Ah, Josh is an absolute dictator. Fantastic. So what's his first move? Sending two spies from Shittim to scout the fortified city of Jericho. Ooh, a spy mission. What kind of cloak and dagger stuff do they do first? They head straight to a prostitute's house. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like these guys already. Yeah. And the king of Jericho hears about this, and he tells the prostitute, Rahab, that he wants the two spies brought to him. What? The king has already found out about the spies? Spies? How? Unknown. Some spies they turned out to be. Not the greatest. And why would the king ask a prostitute to bring two grown men to him? I mean, that's not going to happen. Why wouldn't his first action be to simply send some soldiers as soon as he got the news? Unclear. Huh. And there's this whole Keystone Cops routine as some sort of authorities do eventually show up to grab the spies. Uh-oh. Sounds like these spies, as inept as they are, are going to have a really hard time getting out of this situation. Actually, it's going to be super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yep. Rahab just hides the spies under some flax stalks on her roof. Really? Have you seen these sizes of the dwellings in our primitive corner of the Middle East? Yes, I have. They're tiny. And stop calling us primitive. Are you telling me that the cops can't find two grown men hiding on this woman's roof? Yes. I've watched my own kids play hide and seek, and I guarantee they'd find these guys inside of a minute. Well, the king's men don't. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
Wow. So the Keystone cops head on a wild goose chase out of the city thanks to Rahab's misdirection, and the gates of the city are closed behind them. <laughs> this is all so entertainingly unlikely. Thank you. So why is Rahab helping the enemies of her country? She's heard how God, utilizing his dark Jedi powers, has helped the Israelites exterminate anyone in their way, and she's scared. God's using his dark Jedi powers again? How so? He puts dread of the Israelites into their adversaries so that their courage fails them in battle. These PSYOPs campaigns sound amazingly effective. Why doesn't God use them all the time? I don't know. Well, okay then. So Rahab strikes a deal with the spies to betray her country in exchange for the lives of her family. She's selling out her people just like that? Yes. Wow. So the spies tell Rahab to hang a scarlet cloth outside her home to mark it so her family isn't murdered when the Israelites take Jericho. Oh, it reminds me of a tiny Passover. Oh, how cute. So the spies go back to Josh to tell him that the genocide is ready to go. Strike while the iron is hot, I always say. I have never heard you say that. Shut up. So rather than striking while the iron is hot, God decides this would be a great time for Joshua to circumcise all the Israelite men. What? Now? Yes, the Israelites hadn't been keeping up with the ritual penile mutilation while wandering the desert these last 40 years. Of all the times to incapacitate the troops, the eve of the siege of Jericho is the time God thinks Josh should do this. Yes. Wow. Let me imagine the scene. Oh, please don't. Thousands of men have to walk up to another man. Oh, God. And present their penises. You just happen to have that with you. And Josh takes their penis into his hand. And then Josh saws away at the extremely sensitive foreskin with a crude flint knife. And there would be copious amounts of blood, presumably. Because these are grown men with large grown man penises. Ugh. Does he just toss the foreskins on the ground or into a basket? Can we move on? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> So with everyone up to date with their circumcisions, the Israelite horde finally turns its sights on Jericho. Oh boy, sounds like an action-packed battle is about to ensue. You'd think so, right? But nope, the citizens of Jericho just hunker down behind their walls and apparently offer no resistance whatsoever. Oh, I'll bet the Israelites, what with their penises being sore and all, are probably happy they don't have to exert themselves too much. Can you stop with the penises? Sorry. So if no one in Jericho is poking his head above the parapet, what does the horde do? There's this whole thing where they march round and round the periphery of Jericho blowing horns for a whole week. And at the end of all this, the walls magically come tumbling down. Wow, no blows exchanged, no bloodshed, and Jericho is completely defenseless. This siege could not have gone better. Total slam dunk. What a perfect opportunity for the Israelites to show some mercy and give the citizens of Jericho a chance to follow the one true God, abundant in grace and love. I guess it would have been, but they're not gonna do that. Oh, they're not? Nope, the horde just hack every living thing to death and then burn the city to the ground. But what about the women and children? Hacked to death with swords. Cattle, sheep, donkeys, hacked to death. Swords. Well, okay then. And what happens to Rahab and her family? The Horde actually honors its agreement and allows her and her family to live. Oh, that was so nice of them. Yeah. Now that virtually every person her family has ever known has been hacked to pieces and their city burned to the ground, do Rahab and her family head off for some distant relative's house? No, they live with the Israelites. They live with the conquerors who butchered their neighbors. Yes. What the heck is wrong with Rahab and her family? They sold out their people to save their own miserable hides from the horde, and now they live among them? At the very least, does it say they're racked with guilt for the rest of their days? There's nothing about that in here. In fact, we're going to hold up Rahab as being practically a saint. And as smart, proactive, tricky, and unafraid to disobey and deceive her king. That is some pretty outrageous spin there. Well, the Horde are the victors here, and the victors write the history. They do, don't they? They also keep all the silver and gold looted from the city. Well, the precious metal is actually for God, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. The priests will keep it nice and safe. Sweet. It is a good time to be a priest. It sure is, you know. Could it be any easier to rake in mountains of riches than sending your armies to conquer a city and steal all its wealth? Hard to imagine an easier way.
there's this whole thing where they march round and round the periphery of Jericho blowing horn, 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 horn. <sighs>